Welcome to lecture number 18. We're learning about geothermal. Uh, this lecture is specific to high temperature geothermal resources. The next lecture will be about low temperature. So let's uh, get right into it. We're going to start by talking, uh, we'll go with black actually. So we always start talking about the resource. So that is the first thing we'll be talking about today. Uh, so, so far we've talked about um, a few different sources of energy, right? We talked about solar power, uh, we talked about wind power, sorry my pen's freaking out, let me just get that fixed real quick, there we go. We talked about wind power, we haven't talked about, but there also exists wave power, we're going to discuss biomass, the burning of plants, or anything that grows, I guess those are all plants. And then, of course, fossil fuels. And what's crazy about all of these things is they are all solar power. Right? No matter what it is, it's just solar power evident somehow in some way. Whether it's happening right now or if it was solar power that arrived at the Earth millions of years ago, like fossil fuels. Um, wind, wave, and biomass are stored versions. Uh, oh, we should also include hydro here. Wind, wave, and biomass are stored versions of solar power, and so is hydro. Okay, there's one we haven't talked about that we won't be talking about. Tidal power, using the variation in the height of the ocean to extract energy. Well, that comes from the body, the celestial body that generates the tides, the moon. So tidal power is moon power. But that leaves out one obvious one, the one we're talking about today, geothermal. Geothermal power is unique because it is Earth power. Energy actually originating from the Earth, although depending on what technology we're talking about, some of it is also solar power. Specifically, our high temperature resources, what we're talking about today, are almost entirely from the Earth, the inner core of the Earth, whereas um, low temperature resources, a geo, a ground source heat pump, uses energy coming from the earth but also utilizes energy from the sun as well mostly sun in fact okay so let's look at the earth if if we took a, a slice out of the earth and here's its core and here's the surface this plot right here tells us about what the temperature variation would look like with height in kilometers so the earth's radius is um, 6,370 kilometers, right? I think it's actually a little greater than that. Um, but this shows you how it changes. Um, some important facts first. There are 10 to the 31 joules of energy available inside of the Earth. That is um, just an unbelievable number, one we can't even comprehend or, or figure out what that means. Uh, the Earth's core is at 7,000 degrees Celsius. Oh, actually, sorry, that's Kelvin, not Celsius. Okay, and then the um, estimated, this isn't hasn't been measured completely, but the estimated power from heat transfer from the Earth is 30 terawatts. So at any moment in time, 30 terawatts of power of energy is leaving so 30 terajoules of energy is leaving the earth every second this is approximately double current human consumption we'll abbreviate that okay that heat is obviously ultimately lost into space okay uh so let's talk about why the earth's uh temperature profile looks the way it does so here's our profile again. Uh, right around here, we have, whoops, we have radioactive decay of elements, um, things like uranium and thorium and even potassium, which I thought was surprising. Okay, so all these things are decaying actually here in the mantle. 
Um, and these generate heat. And this heat ultimately, ultimately must leave the Earth. Well, that heat isn't going to travel inwards because heat always goes in the direction of a decreasing temperature. Likewise, where would it go if it goes inwards towards the center of the Earth? There's nothing there, just the center of the Earth. It's like an insulated boundary condition. So instead, that heat travels outward, which is why we see this sudden huge increase in the temperature profile through the Earth's crust. Um, a lot of the energy is generated just before that profile, and so as that energy is generated, it must leave this way, increasing the rate of heat transfer through the Earth. Likewise, through this whole section, we have convection heat transfer. The Earth has a somewhat liquid state and so heat is easily transferred you know from the cores to the lower mantle and what this does is decrease the change in temperature with depth um, however once we hit the lithosphere being the uppermost section of the earth's crust then we have only conduction heat transfer Okay, and with conduction heat transfer, that is not as efficient or not as effective as convective heat transfer. So we need a larger temperature gradient in order to move the same amount of heat. Another reason why we see this sudden increase in the change in temperature with depth. And so the um, change in temperature with Z, if this is Z, in the lithosphere is actually 30 degrees Celsius per kilometer. Um, so that would be here in this region right here. Okay, now that's this is kind of on average, but there are um, boundaries of the tectonic plates uh, where convection reaches the crust, reaches the surface. So in other words, this convection of magma in the Earth's surface, in the Earth's core, actually reaches the surface, and that is a thing we call a hot spot, an area where <clears throat> the crust might not be as thin or where two tectonic plates have met, and so there's kind of this local, very hot spot relative to the rest of the Earth. Let's talk about those hot spots those hot spots because they are very important when it comes to the actual extraction of energy for use as electricity from the earth. So a hot spot, um, in technical terms we call it a high enthalpy zone or a high enthalpy region. Enthalpy being um, kind of an indicator of thermal energy. It's the combination of flow energy or pressure combined with the internal energy or thermal energy. Uh, so these hot spots ultimately manifest themselves as high temperature, high pressure water. And this is kind of what it looks like. So here's the surface of the earth. And this has what we're going to call a cap rock. Cap rock is impermeable. Ooh, didn't look up how to spell that before. Uh, impermeable meaning that water cannot penetrate this rock. Okay, we also have more rock down here that is also watertight. We'll just use that word instead. Okay, so we've got watertight water above and below a certain very important region, specifically the water table. So the water table is the region of rock that is porous and water is able to flow through this part of the rock easily, relatively easily. It's not like there's a river down there sometimes, uh, but it's just more like a spongy rock where water can flow. Okay, so now a hot spot is when oops, we have some magma very close to the Earth's surface. My, this might be at the location where two tectonic plates meet, which means that we have a large amount of heat compared to the rest of the Earth going into this water. Because this water is pressurized, right, it can't escape out the top or the bottom. Um, so it's it, within a constant volume, it will become pressurized. 
and as you pressurize it and add energy, the temperature will slowly increase until it reaches the boiling point. Once it's reached the boiling point, it will turn into steam, and that steam's pressure will start to increase. So we actually have right here trapped steam. This is in the case of a very high enthalpy zone. We might not always have steam. It could still be just water, but hot water, very hot water. Hot, high pressure water. And so what we're going to do and what we'll discuss in the next lecture is some technology we can use to drill down and access this steam and then pipe it out and use it in some kind of power plant. That's what we'll talk about in the next lecture. Uh, for now, let's talk about where these resources exist. Okay, so the uh, terminology, we just talked about high enthalpy zones or areas where you have trapped underground steam. That Think of it as trapped energy, easy to utilize. So in that case, high enthalpy is when the temperature of the subsurface of the Earth is greater than 180 degrees Celsius. Um, that's pretty good. We also might have low enthalpy resources where we have this trapped steam, but or even just hot water that's below 100 degrees Celsius. OK, the average heat flux across the entire Earth's surface, so if we measure the heat flux at any point and measure, averaged all the points of the Earth, we would get 60 milliwatts per meter squared. So this is an extremely dilute resource, really di even more dilute than the sun, right? This is just a small amount of heat. Uh, but then when you look at a hot spot, a hot spot has an average heat flux of 300 milliwatts per meter squared. So five times greater, and this is on average, there are some that have much, much higher. Um, on this plot, I've shown kind of the tectonic plate boundaries, and you can see that all the hot spots, at least a lot of them, generally coincide with either the boundaries or places where there's known geological activity like Yellowstone or Pacific Islands. Uh, so anywhere where there's some sort of um, rupture in the tectonic plate. Okay, uh, here is a map of the United States and some of the anticipated abilities um, to deploy um, geothermal electric generating plants. Uh, we also show as yellow circles. Um, those are identified sites greater than 90 degrees Celsius. So those are anything that's low enthalpy or above. Um, and then here's favorability for actual extraction of energy as electricity from these places. Okay, um, also more related to the low temperature um, lecture next time is the average subsurface temperature um, anywhere in the United States is actually equivalent to the yearly air average temperature. So if you average the temperature uh, at every day of the year over an entire year period, you'll find the average temperature um, of the earth, of the subsurface earth, and that's at about 10 meters below. And so this is why in the next lecture, uh, so you can see here, this is real geothermal power. This is energy originating from the Earth. When we're talking about average subsurface temperature 10 meters below, um, that really is driven by the sun, right? So we have the ground and the sun plus convection from wind, which is driven by the sun, is increasing or decreasing the temperature if this is the temperature, say this is wintertime and summertime. So we kind of have a temperature some distance, we'll say 10 meters below, that's about constant. And that is really governed by the sun and the location of where you are. So this is more stored solar energy, but there's still a contribution from the earth. But when we're talking about um, 
low temperature resources, it's mostly the sun that's doing the work here. All right, so let's now talk about technology we use to extract high enthalpy resources and turn it into electricity.